Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Colorado Law Talk. My name is Georgette Vigil. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach at Colorado Law. During the presentation, Zoom participants can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Professor Lowenstein will respond to questions following the presentation. As a reminder, everyone is on mute. We're excited to have over 480 registrants for this evening's talk, uh, joining us from New York to Washington, and of course, here in Colorado. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce Jim Anaya, Dean of Colorado Law. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's Colorado Law Talk on the cases every business lawyer should know, featuring Professor Mark Lowenstein. The, the Colorado Law Talk series was launched in 2017 uh, to share the, the groundbreaking research and knowledge of the University of Colorado Law School faculty with the broader legal community in the Denver area, and especially now that we've gone virtual uh, around the state and beyond. Uh, Mark Lowenstein is the Montfort Professor and Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs at Colorado Law. Uh, his research interests center on business associations, agency law, and securities law. And he also has an interest in uh, corporate governance. Uh, he has numerous published works in these areas, and he's known for his national expertise. His extraordinary passion for and dedication to his work will be apparent to all during his presentation. All of you attending the webinar have available to you in your program additional biographical information on Professor Lowenstein. It's with pleasure that I now turn the virtual podium over to Professor Lowenstein. Thank you, Dean and Aya. Um, and uh, I'd also like to give some thanks to the IT crew who uh, helped uh, put this together, Teresa Coberly and uh, John C. Bray. Uh, we have a terrific IT department at the law school, and we're especially appreciative in these days of um, remote classing and uh, remote classes and online teaching. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Georgette Vigil and uh, Yesenia Delgado, uh, terrific members of our staff who um, helped put all this together. So um, with that, I think I can launch into the presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, do something with these. Um, I don't need to see my own face. I think I'll do better not seeing it. So um, with that, let's get started. Um, you should have had access uh, to the uh, materials cases I want to cover today real quickly. Uh, I want to start with limited liability companies uh, looking at four uh, important um, concepts and issues uh, uh, there. Uh, first one, using a corporate structure in an LLC. Um, the, uh, what I call unexpected fiduciary duties uh, that we see uh, courts uh, increasingly applying. Um, the oppression concept in LLCs and uh, the uh, fiduciary duty of good faith. Um, I then wanna move on to corporate law uh, look at four duties there, oversight, care, uh, and loyalty, um, and uh, approving conflicting interest transactions. That's part of the uh, duty of loyalty. And finally, in the corporate area, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, right, the uh, contractual duty of good faith, uh, which of course covers all uh, business entities. Um, and finally, I want to say a word about partnership law, uh, even though uh, to a large extent, um, most new entities uh, opt for uh, LLCs and not partnerships or corporations, but um, there's an important issue there that um, I'd like to discuss with you tonight. So uh, let's start out with, uh, again, this question of um, using a corporate structure in an LLC. Uh, it's increasingly common. Um, and uh, operating agreements are set up with boards of directors and officers. And uh, a reasonable question arises in those cases, and that is, 
uh, what are the implications, if any, of using that structure in an LLC? Um, and the uh, subtext is, that is, uh, will corporate law apply? And the answer is, yeah, it may apply depending on what the issue is and how it arises. Um, the Obeid case uh, is a nice example of that. Um, we had an LLC that was uh, sued by a member um, in uh, a derivative type action. Uh, the uh, managers appointed a special litigation committee and included a non-manager on that committee. And the question was, uh, is that permissible? Um, and the court said, no, it's not. Uh, because you're using a special litigation committee uh, in the context of a, um, a corporate-like structure, uh, we're going to make the determination under corporate law. Uh, we're going to look to corporate law for guidance. And uh, under corporate law, uh, you can't have a board committee uh, that includes non-board members. Uh, so uh, in that uh, vein, the court decided that that non-manager could not serve, uh, or uh, non-director really, could not serve on that committee. Um, the court went on, the Delaware Chancery Court, went on to state almost the obvious, that is um, when questions of interpretation arise in a member-managed LLC, uh, the courts would, should look to general partnership law. Similarly for um, manager-managed LLCs, that is where we have passive members um, and uh, uh, looking to a manager to operate the entity, that's like a limited partnership and uh, courts will look to limited partnership law. And finally, as in this case, if you have a corporate law structure um, in the LLC, then um, the courts may look to corporate law for guidance. Um, a more recent case, Freeman versus LLC, um, I post here because uh, I think the, uh, the greatest number of cases uh, deal with indemnification rights. And uh, the LLC statute in Delaware uh, doesn't specifically address that. Um, uh, and as uh, LLCs are contractual entities, uh, the thought is that the operating agreement will, in, will address indemnification rights. And in this particular case, the uh, operating agreement tracked the language of uh, section 145 of the Delaware code, uh, which um, sets forth corporate indemnification provisions. And uh, they just substituted for officers and directors uh, members and managers. Um, and then the question became whether the uh, manager, whether the uh, manager or member, I forget which it was, who was seeking indemnification rights um, needed to be acting in the capacity on behalf of the uh, LLC. Uh, that's the case in corporate law. Officers and directors are uh, may be indemnified when they're acting on behalf of the entity. Uh, and the court in Freeman said, um, the same rule ought to apply in LLCs uh, because it appears that that's the, that was the intent of the provision uh, that you uh, tracked. Um, now, if you're worrying about the, uh, the member who was seeking indemnification, the court also held that he was able to prove uh, that he was acting in an official capacity. Um, so uh, there was a Colorado case decided last year that takes this concept, I would say, beyond uh, its logical extreme, uh, Kissinger versus Fellman, um, which involved an intergovernmental agency that was not any kind of a business entity, certainly not a corporation because it didn't file one, didn't file for one, nor an LLC uh, or any kind of a partnership. Um, and uh, uh, it did though, this agency have a board of directors and officers and the Colorado Court of Appeals said, hey, let's treat this uh, as a corporation. 
and uh, the questions that were involved there related to dissolution uh, and some other issues, which really should not have been treated uh, under corporate law. There was really no reason to. Um, so this case was brought to my attention by my uh, good friend, Herrick Lidstone, and he's written about it in the May newsletter uh, of the CBA business law section. So uh, you may want to take a look at that if you're interested in uh, seeing how a Colorado court deals with a situation in which a company has officers, a uh, company, when any kind of a group has officers and directors. Um, an increasingly important concept or one that's coming up quite often in the case law is the role of equity. Um, and it's important in this context to bear in mind that uh, for LLCs anyway, uh, the general understanding as expressed often by the Delaware and other courts is that LLCs are contractual entities. And so what that suggests is the rights and obligations of the parties, um, be they managers, members, or otherwise, ought to be set forth uh, in the operating agreement. Well, VGS is an, uh, a Delaware case uh, with an extensive chancery decision um, affirmed by the Supreme Court, but never uh, officially reported. Um, but it's important because uh, that case shows the willingness of the Delaware courts uh, to apply notions of fairness and equity in um, resolving disputes among the parties. The facts are kind of interesting. There's really two members of the LLC, a majority and a minority member. The majority member, the plaintiff, appointed two of the managers and the minority member appointed one. Um, the, uh, the two managers other than the uh, majority owner uh, that is the one person he appointed and the uh, minority member, those two guys got together and basically froze out the majority owner. Um, they engineered a merger and followed the provisions of the operating agreement and the Delaware statute in doing so. Uh, they only informed the majority member after they had done their dirty deed. And uh, he did what anybody would do under those circumstances, or at least we hope. He went to court uh, and sued them, but the cause of action was a little difficult to articulate. After all, um, they argued that they were acting in the best interest of the entity, that the majority member was running it badly, and that they needed to take this action. And the court responded kind of surprisingly, well, that's just not right. Uh, we can't permit this to stand. Um, they, being the ma managers, owed a duty to their co-manager, which is kind of a new duty. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, that uh, uh, equity would step in uh, and kind of resolve uh, this dispute. Um, I think there's a better way and a better understanding of this case, uh, and that is that the um, contractual duty of good faith and fair dealing ought to apply, uh, which is to say that under the operating agreement, while these two managers had the right to undertake the, the action that they took, operating in good faith, they wouldn't have done that without notifying the majority member. Um, a more recent case uh, from last year that got a lot of publicity uh, was the In Ray Carlisle, et cetera, case, where the court held that, the Chancery Court held that um, even though the party seeking to dissolve uh, the LLC was neither a member nor a manager, um, equity would step in under these circumstances and grant standing uh, to this uh, party uh, to seek a dissolution. Uh, the facts are compelling as they are in any equity case. Uh, the parties had uh, drafted a, a uh, operating agreement, which they never kind of completed and signed off on, which would have made this particular party to the lawsuit 
a member with that standing. Um, but, uh, and under those circumstances, the court went ahead and said, uh, we'll grant standing and allow them to, um, and, and consider their claim for dissolution. All right, the uh, next issue in the LLC area is one that should be a particular concern, I think, to um, people counseling uh, investors in an LLC. Uh, and it's the oppression doctrine. Um, we uh, are all familiar with uh, the close corporation doctrine uh, that um, the reasonable expectation of minority shareholders uh, has to be honored and protected by the majority shareholders. Uh, there are um, a number of cases in Colorado and beyond that uh, express and develop this concept. And it emanates from um, some cases in the mid seventies in Massachusetts, which are in every corporate case book, uh, Wilkes versus Springside Nursing and Donahue versus Rod Electrotype. Uh, in those cases, basically the court was saying uh, that the parties entered into these closely held corporations with the understanding that um, this was more like a partnership arrangement uh, and that they didn't want to form a partnership because of tax and liability reasons. Uh, but that's basically the arrangement that they had. And uh, if the uh, majority shareholders or a group of majority shareholders gets together and tries to freeze out a minority shareholder, uh, contrary to the expectations that they all might have had when they formed the entity, well, equity will step in uh, and provide relief for the minority shareholders. As I said, this is a well accepted uh, doctrine across corporate law. And the question arises to whether this kind of a doctrine applies in LLC law as well, uh, where you have several individuals coming together as members to form an LLC, um, ought they have that same expectation uh, of protection uh, from being frozen out or otherwise uh, disadvantaged in their relationship? Uh, increasingly, uh, the answer to that question in the courts is yes. And um, as this slide indicate, Pointer versus Castellina Castellini is a, uh, a case in point, unintended. Um, so in the uh, uh, Pointer case, I, I think the facts are particularly compelling and egregious um, for non-application of this principle. The plaintiff was the um, sole manager of the LLC, was the manager of the LLC with a uh, a contract and his uh, co-members um, thought that he wasn't doing what he should be doing uh, and fired him. Uh, he had a pretty good case for breach of contract if he had any case at all, uh, but he chose to bring instead an oppression claim and say that he had an expectation of continuing on in that capacity and of possibly eventually uh, being able to purchase their equity interests. And in a surprising opinion, at least to me, the Massachusetts High Court said, yeah, um, that doctrine that we developed in the mid 70s applies with equal force uh, in this situation. And so uh, the remedy that was given was, I thought, um, devastating to the other members was well beyond anything um, like a breach of contract action uh, and uh, brings home an important lesson, I think, for somebody counseling people forming an LLC. And that is uh, that you have to take this doctrine into account, uh, that it's not enough just to say in the operating agreement uh, that majority rules uh, because majority, uh, the majority voting may have to take into account uh, the non-contractual expectations uh, of the minority members. Uh, that's the teaching from corporate law and applies with equal force 
uh, now in LLC law. Uh, uh, another recent case, just to give you an example, uh, comes out of California in 2015, the Frisi case. Um, in that case, um, a member of the LLC uh, borrowed money against his interest uh, and gave a security interest to, we'll say member number two. Um, member, but member number two never uh, filed uh, a, the appropriate UCC doctrines, never perfected uh, the security interest. That same member uh, also uh, borrowed money from member number three. Um, member number three knew uh, that there is an unperfected security interest against that membership interest and uh, did uh, uh, file and did perfect his interest. So uh, we have three members of the LLC. One of them has uh, given a security interest in his membership interest to two of them, uh, but only one perfected his interest. The one who perfected the interest uh, was a manager. And the other member found out about it, sued the manager, and claimed uh, a breach of fiduciary duty. And uh, the court agreed and said that even though the manager was not dealing as a manager, that is, was just uh, transacting business in his individual capacity, he still had to take into account um, the uh, interests of the other member and uh, and therefore a claim uh, would be recognized. All right, um, just moving on to corporate law now. Uh, we uh, are familiar with the doctrine of uh, oversight in corporate law. That is that the directors of a, of a corporation have a fiduciary duty to make sure that they put in place a system of oversight to assure that the company is complying with applicable law. Um, the Delaware courts first recognized this in the In Ray Caremark decision uh, several years ago. And in 2006, in a case called Stone versus Ritter, the um, Delaware Supreme Court reaffirmed that doctrine. Interestingly, adopting the Chancery decision and the Caremark decision many years earlier. Uh, but regardless, uh, the concept that emerges is a clear one. Uh, that is, the directors have a duty to make sure that they put in place uh, a system uh, to assure that the company is complying uh, with uh, all legal requirements. If they fail to do that, um, they clearly have a, uh, they breached their duty. And what Stone versus Ritter uh, established was that is a duty of uh, good faith, which in turn is part of the duty of loyalty. Um, and what that means, of course, is that it cannot be exculpated uh, in the certificate of incorporation. All right, I wanted to, uh, this is old, old learning. Uh, but I wanted to mention the, uh, uh, the Marchand case, uh, Marchand versus Barnhill, which was decided just last year um, uh, and pretty much uh, the same issue. This case uh, involved the uh, Blue Bonnet uh, ice cream company. Um, and their problem was uh, a listeria outbreak at three of their manufacturing facilities. Uh, three people, unfortunately, three consumers uh, died as a result of exposure uh, to the listeria, um, brought a lawsuit and recovered. And then the shareholders turned around and brought a derivative action against the directors and said, <coughs> excuse me, um, you should have been paying attention to this. Uh, we didn't have an adequate system in place uh, to make sure that we were complying with all food safety regulations. Uh, now, what's interesting about this is that the, um, the managers of the company, the officers, uh, regularly reported to the board uh, that they were in compliance with all 
uh, FDA regulations. Um, and the board accepted that at face value uh, and did nothing further about it. Um, the Chancery uh, Court dismissed the complaint uh, saying basically that, you know, there was no more that the directors uh, were responsible for doing and the Supreme Court uh, reversed, the Delaware Supreme Court. And what they said was that the complaint did state a cause of action and um, it's not enough uh, for the directors to ask officers, is everything okay? And the officers replied, yeah, everything's cool. You know, which has a double meaning when we're talking about a company that manufactures ice cream, uh, when in fact, not everything was cool. Uh, and um, the takeaway from the case is uh, pretty clear. Uh, that is, uh, the board has an affirmative obligation to do more than that, uh, to um, at least question the officers, uh, to require that the officers document um, their conclusions uh, that the uh, food safety uh, requirements of the law have been totally complied with. Um, so it's a, a heavy obligation. Um, the directors cannot defend on the basis that they made a reasonable bus business judgment under the circumstances. Um, they cannot, for instance, um, review what the cost of a more extensive uh, compliance system would be and to make a determination that it's not worth the cost? No, uh, the bottom line is uh, that they have to have in place some kind of a system uh, to assure compliance uh, with uh, applicable law. Uh, the other question that, uh, the, or maybe a question I should say, the Marchand case leaves open is, how far does that extend? After all, a large corporation operating in multiple jurisdictions uh, and sometimes many lines of business obviously has uh, lots of legal requirements uh, to, uh, to be aware of and concerned with. Um, the Delaware uh, decisions have not addressed that at all, um, but I think that's coming down the road. Uh, where a company says, well, uh, my goodness, uh, uh, the directors need to lean on managers uh, and expect them uh, to discharge that obligation, uh, at least with respect to things that are not core to the company's business. I think that's the next area where we'll see some development here. Uh, duty of care and business judgment rule. Uh, this is, you know, prime uh, ground for uh, corporate law. What is the duty of care? What is the business judgment rule? Uh, Smith versus Van Gorkum, a uh, blockbuster 1985 case that um, is in all the corporate case books, or at least most of them, um, is really a seminal case because it makes clear uh, that the duty of care is not a simple negligence standard, but rather a gross negligence standard. Um, it makes clear that uh, there's a presumption that the directors did act with care and that the burden is on somebody challenging them uh, to uh, prove otherwise, or at least to make a prima facie case uh, that they were not uh, grossly, that they were grossly negligence, negligent. Um, third, that um, once that showing has been made with respect to care, that is that the directors uh, were grossly negligent, uh, they've got to justify their decision as one that was fair to the corporation. And if, for instance, uh, they were grossly negligent in deciding to sell an important corporate asset, uh, they may be liable for the difference between the price that they received uh, and the price that they would have landed upon had they exercised adequate care. Uh, and that's basically uh, all established in the Smith versus Van Gorkum case in the context of a decision by the board um, to sell the company as a whole, to merge the company into the company of the acquirer. 
Well, um, as you know, there are two important consequences to this. Uh, one is that um, the Delaware legislature, soon to be followed by uh, most of the legis almost all of the uh, states, um, allows corporations now to uh, exculpate directors for breach of the duty of care, including uh, breach of the uh, including when they act with gross negligence. That is to say, only when they act with um, intentional misconduct, at least in the care realm, uh, could they be subject to this fairness test. Um, this, so one thing is we now have these uh, options for corporations to include in their articles, or in Delaware, their certificate of incorporation, a provision exculpating the directors from liability uh, for uh, grossly negligent conduct. Um, this was all kind of developed by case law uh, in Delaware and to a smaller extent elsewhere. Uh, but in the last iteration of the Model Business Corporation Act, um, it's now part of, the, uh, of that act and uh, was enacted last year in Colorado in our Colorado Business Corporation Act. Um, so Smith versus Van Gorkum and all of its, um, I guess, aspects uh, can now be found in the CBCA. And uh, less, uh, there's less of a need to rely on case law to describe uh, a claim against directors. Last thing on this um, is whether uh, is what kind of a duty this imposes on a lawyer uh, drafting articles of incorporation. Um, do you include that exculpation provision or not? Um, and here, I think we're talking about questions of professional responsibility. Uh, if you're representing multiple parties and forming a corporation, and some are gonna be active, some are gonna be passive investors, um, that's an issue that needs to be discussed uh, and agreed to by the parties. That is, what is the duty of care that um, directors of this entity uh, will be subject to? Um, duty of loyalty, uh, Lewis versus SLE, a Fifth Circuit decision, uh, not terribly well known, but I like to, to refer to this case as kind of an important duty of loyalty case. And the reason is that it represents such a common fact scenario. Um, you have a individual forms a, uh, a corporation, a business entity, a uh, operating entity, uh, and um, sells or gives shares to other members of the family, uh, and then sets up a separate second entity uh, in which, uh, which will own the real estate that the operating uh, operating company uh, will uh, be utilizing. Um, what happened in Lewis was that um, the operating company and the real estate company did not have identical ownership. Um, the family members who were active in the business um, owned shares in both, but the passive family members whom received the shares, I think, as gifts, uh, basically just owned shares in the real estate company. Well, you can guess what happened. Uh, the real estate company and the operating company had a lease, uh, which was not terribly favorable to the real estate company. And um, in a case in which we have someone not terribly appreciative of the shares that uh, he received, uh, he sues. And his claim is that the directors of the real estate company were conflicted because they also owned the operating company and the lease was at too low a price. And the court said, you know what? This is the burden. Uh, the burden is gonna be placed here on these conflicted to directors to prove that the uh, operating, that the lease was a fair one uh, and was at market value. And they couldn't do that. Part of the reason was they said, uh, you know, we're paying all we can. Uh, and uh, 
you know, otherwise we're going to be in financial difficulty. And the court said, that's not an excuse. Um, if you can't, uh, you can't pay a fair rental, uh, maybe you ought to uh, make some other kind of arrangement. So it's something to take into account when, um, uh, when you have that kind of a situation, or really when you ever have a situation where you have passive shareholders uh, and active shareholders, uh, and the active shareholders um, are contracting in some capacity uh, with the corporation. Um, I'm kind of running a little short on time here. Uh, let me just say a word about the con case, controlling party transactions. Um, when a majority shareholder um, enters into a transaction with the controlled corporation, and we're normally talking here about a parent subsidiary situation, um, the directors of the subsidiary find themselves in kind of an awkward position. That is, uh, they're kind of beholden to their shareholder, the majority shareholder, uh, but they're also have some kind of a duty to the minority shareholders uh, who um, are interested, obviously, in, in this transaction as well. Uh, there's lots of law on this now. Um, most of it's coming out of Delaware, but some other states as well. And the challenge for the um, directors of the subsidiary is to try and get business judgment rule protection. That is no scrutiny of the decision they made. Um, and uh, the Delaware courts, um, as I said, through a number of decisions have said, yeah, you can do that, but here's what you have to do. Um, the group or the directors who negotiate with the majority shareholder have to be completely independent of the majority shareholder. Uh, can't be beholden to, the, beholden to the majority shareholder in any way, have to have independent counsel uh, and independent uh, advisors, be they investment bankers or otherwise, uh, to allow them to negotiate um, from a position of strength and knowledge uh, with the majority shareholder. Um, second, uh, they have to condition approval of the transaction on, an, on the vote of a majority of the minority shareholders. And if you do all that, uh, and you can demonstrate that you've done all that, uh, then the court will defer to the business judgment uh, of the directors of the subsidiary uh, corporation. A uh, case decided last year, uh, the Olenek decision out of Delaware said, um, you've got to have all this in place before you undertake any meaningful negotiations. Um, so the Delaware courts, uh, as, in this, as in this area of the law, demonstrate their, um, their commitment uh, in what I call end game transactions, that is transactions in which the minority shareholders are gonna lose their equity interest. Uh, the Delaware courts are committed to making sure uh, that the uh, transaction in which that occurs uh, has all the procedural safeguards uh, that it could have. Um, contractual duty of good faith uh, is a concept that um, permeates the law in all areas. Uh, the general idea is that um, a party exercising rights under a contract has to exercise those consistent uh, with the implied obligation of good faith. What does that mean? Um, well, as a general matter, it means that um, it's got to, the way you exercise your rights has to be consistent with the understanding of the parties, uh, at least to the extent, or at least in those instances in which the, um, the matter in, in question is not resolved by the contract itself. So let me put this kind of abstract uh, notions in a, a context of the Nemec case, which I think is a terrific teaching tool. Uh, in Nemec, you had uh, officers of a corporation who had retired and owned uh, stock in the corporation. Uh, the corporation had a right to redeem that stock at book value. 
or a formula based on book value. Um, the corporation, uh, uh, the corporate directors entered into negotiations to sell the corporation um, at what turned out to be uh, quite a premium in relationship to the, um, uh, the price that they could purchase the shares from their retired officers. Um, in fact, um, the, the price at which they could uh, purchase from their officers was $162 per share. And at the same time, they were negotiating with Booz Allen uh, to, um, I'm sorry, uh, with the Carlisle Group to sell uh, a, their division for uh, in excess of uh, $700 a share more than that. Well, the directors decided to exercise their option. They cashed out the retired officers, sold the company, and the retired officers uh, brought a lawsuit and said, you can't do that. Um, you know, you have an obligation to interpret your right to purchase our stock consistent with this notion of good faith. And that's not good faith. Uh, the Delaware Supreme Court said, you know what, this is addressed in the agreement. There is no restriction on their ability to exercise this option. Uh, and therefore, there's no room for us uh, to make a determination that this violates the, the contractual duty of good faith. Um, so um, it's a case that, you know, was possible to make the claim uh, that there's good faith, but it demonstrates uh, that the court is not going to easily um, uh, exercise uh, that kind of judicial option uh, to expand the rights of a party. If you want something, uh, put it uh, in the agreement itself. Um, last case I want to mention to you today uh, is the St. Alphonsus care case coming out of Idaho. Idaho doesn't get a lot of respect. Um, not a lot of people cite Idaho cases, uh, but I, uh, I wanna give Idaho uh, some good feelings tonight. So let me just say a word uh, about this case. And it involves the power to dissociate from a partnership. All right, so the general rule in partnership law is that unless the partnership agreement provides otherwise, um, any partner can dissociate from the partnership at any time and under modern partnership law is entitled to be paid out. Well, um, St. Alphonsus was a hospital and they had a deal with their, uh, with the um, uh, MRI associates uh, relating to um, using MRI for their MRI needs, that is for the hospital's MRI needs. They made a partnership uh, between the, um, the MRI associates and the hospital itself. And um, the uh, partnership agreement said that the hospital could dissociate from the partnership um, under, if any one of the following was, was true. And there were five uh, conditions under which uh, they could, pursuant to the partnership agreement, dissociate from the partnership. Well, um, Colorado law, uh, which I cite here on this, uh, on this slide, is the same as Idaho law. It's the Uniform Partnership Act, the revised Uniform Partnership Act, and it grants the power to dissociate, as I said earlier, um, and provides it's wrongful only if it's in breach of an express provision in the partnership agreement. Well, um, the uh, hospital withdrew from the partnership for a reason other than one of the five listed. And the, um, their partner said, that's a wrongful dissociation, uh, you owe us damages. And the court said, no, it's not. Um, it wasn't one of the five listed reasons but there's nothing in the partnership agreement that said uh, these were exclusive and that uh, 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 therefore it was not uh, violative of an express partnership agreement. So there are very few cases on this. Um, the important thing 
Um, the important takeaway and the reason I raise this case um, is that uh, it indicates that you have to be pretty clear in your partnership agreement if folks are locked in, uh, if people cannot disassociate. So I think that's the last slide. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to um, try and answer them. Oh, you can stop applauding. It's embarrassing, please. They are applauding, that's for sure. <laughs> there, we, we're waiting for some questions to come through. Uh, certainly one of the most popular questions this evening, uh, Mark, is if you would share the slides in the follow-up that we send out. Sure. Okay. Oh, um, do you want to send that to everybody or did you want to I, can I just send them to you and? Yes, you can send them okay. to us and we'll make sure they get them. Uh, there was a comment from Catherine Sutherland. She said it was interesting to see that Bluebell president uh, was criminally indicted. It was interesting for her maybe, but not for him. <laughs> uh, people are thanking you for your sense of humor and appreciate your knowledge. Uh, they are saying great talk. Um, let's see. Could the pointer holding implied, implied fiduciary duty among the members in the closely held LLC be nullified or altered by an express contract between the members of the LLC? And that comes from uh, Professor Schwartz. Well. Thank you, Professor Schwartz, for that nice softball. Um, absolutely. And I think that's really the, uh, an important point. And that is that these are, that the pointer case itself really is a default rule. Um, if the uh, LLC operating agreement doesn't directly address that question, uh, then um, the judicial uh, opinion will fill that uh, gap. But yeah, and I think, I think it's important uh, whether we're dealing with a shareholders agreement uh, in a corporation or an operating agreement in an LLC or really a partnership agreement in a partnership um, to take into account this equitable notion of oppression of minority members and to address it directly um, and even to go so far as to say uh, if you want to do it in a shorthand fashion, that uh, the oppression doctrine doesn't apply here. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but if you, uh, if you don't want to deal with the particular issues that might arise, um, then that's at least one way to go. Uh, thank you. We had some other questions come in. If Delaware seems so liberal in applying equitable principles to business relationships, why do they focus so exclusively on contract principles with the duty of good faith and fair dealing? Um, it's a good question. So a couple things. One is that, you know, when you do cite an equitable case um, and don't mention lots of other cases where they refuse to apply those principles, it does give kind of a, uh, a skewed look at the law. So to put that in another way, um, they're pretty, the Delaware courts uh, are quite willing to um, reject an equitable argument uh, in, in many, many cases. So it's really the exception uh, where they're willing, as in the cases I cited, uh, to turn to equity. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, they found it necessary uh, to rely on good faith principles, um, especially in LLC law, because there, and in partnerships as well, the parties can disclaim uh, virtually all fiduciary duties. And that leaves the courts, uh, when they're reviewing claims, say, made by minority uh, LLC members, with very few tools uh, to provide relief. And the one tool that they have uh, where fiduciary duties have been 
disclaimed is um, the contractual duty of good faith and fair dealing. Um, and so what they have been doing in a number of recent cases is to read contracts, operating agreements very carefully. Uh, and if, uh, a, if a, an issue was left unresolved in the operating agreement, uh, the Delaware courts then will return to the contractual duty of good faith. So those, that's the way I would answer that question. Great, we have two more questions. Uh, or actually, let's see. Okay, sorry, they are moving around a little bit. Uh, with all the bank, this is from John Howard, uh, member of the Law Alumni Board. Uh, with all the bankruptcy and restructuring ongoing, could you comment on the duties of the directors towards shareholders versus a broader range of stakeholders, uh, creditors, employees, et cetera? Uh, sorry in advance if that's beyond the scope. Well, it's beyond the scope. Of course, I'll answer it anyway. Um, uh, you know, uh, the law is becoming increasingly clear, I think, that in the corporate context, uh, corporate directors have to act in the best interest of the uh, shareholders, uh, even when the company is insolvent, or maybe in the what we call the zone of insolvency. Uh, they've got to be thinking about saving the company if they can, uh, and not necessarily uh, worrying about the creditors. And I think maybe that's where that question uh, was headed. Um, yeah, the, uh, it's, it's a tough, uh, I think a lot of directors are gonna find themselves in a very tough situation uh, and uh, their uh, actions are gonna be carefully scrutinized. Very good. Another uh, question, uh, to what extent do you think the Caremark line of cases would apply to public entities. And that's from Catherine Sutherland. I'm not sure what she means by public entities. Uh, I hope not governmental entities. That's not my area. I don't know uh, okay. a political solution or a political answer to actions that our government takes. And, uh, you know, uh, she said, yes, governmental agents or entities. Yeah. No, I, I, I really can't comment on that uh, beyond both the scumbags. Element. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, uh, this is from Mark uh, Waranowski. Uh, thank you, Mark. Are you aware of a case uh, of a case law that would suggest that minority members could be oppressed? not by freezing them out, uh, but by not giving them the opportunity to exit the position, even where the majority members don't exit and where the minority members didn't uh, bargain for a put right, uh, for sale provision or other right to exit. Okay, so um, the Delaware Donahue versus Rod Electrotype addresses that in part, that was a case in which um, the majority members uh, cashed out one of their own. Actually, it was the father uh, and the, his sons were then uh, succeeding him on the board of directors and he wanted to sell his stock. Uh, he wanted to cash out and uh, they agreed to buy his stock, they acting on behalf of the corporation. Well, the minority members said, me too. Uh, I want to, uh, I'd like to sell my stock. I'm not interested in participating uh, in the company. And uh, they said, no, we're not interested. And the, the uh, Massachusetts court said, um, you can't do that. Uh, if you're gonna cash out uh, yourself, you gotta cash out or at least offer to cash out the minority members as well. Now, whether that answers that question in full, uh, I don't know if, uh, as I remember, as I recall, you're uh, reading the question, uh, if the majority members are not cashing out and the minority member does not have a contractual right uh, to sell out, 
I'm not aware of any case uh, or doctrine that would uh, afford that minority member uh, relief under those circumstances. Very good. I have one last question. There are certainly lots of uh, kudos uh, for your presentation, I must say. Um, excellent presentation, all sorts of, of good news all around. Uh, so we appreciate that. One last question from Justin Conrad. Uh, doesn't Colorado law provide that an LLC agreement, which provides for amendment of the LLC agreement by a majority vote, allow for the amendment even if it would run counter to the unwritten expectations of the minority, for example, allowing, did I already read this one? Sounds familiar. For example, allowing the removal of a minority appointed manager. I researched this a couple of years ago and I believe this was the result. How does this square with the oppression holding you, um, holding you discussed, uh, which indicated that the major majority has to consider those unwritten expectations? So, um, you know, a court doesn't have to apply that doctrine if they're not persuaded uh, that it constitutes oppression or that this isn't what the parties essentially agreed to. Um, but I'm also aware of a case in which they, uh, the operating agreement was amended to remove rights of the minority shareholder and the court set that aside. So uh, there may, you know, the Colorado court may not have gone in that direction, but there is precedent that would have supported that outcome. I see Dean and I is getting ready to say something. No? No, you can keep talking. <laughs> All right. Well, if nobody asks any question, I, I've got That enough. was the last question. So I'll okay. turn it over to uh, Dean and I. Thank you, Mark, yeah, for a terrific presentation, a great overview and analysis of key aspects of business law. And thank you all for joining and, and for your insightful uh, questions. Uh, by early next week, you'll receive a link to the presentation and, and, and a survey to, so you can share your thoughts with us. And um, remember that Colorado attorneys will receive a link for the CLE affidavit. The next Colorado Law Talks is when you won't want to miss. Uh, it's on June 2, 2020, with Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. He'll be talking on leadership in a time of crisis. If this were one of our in-person Colorado Law Talks, we'd invite you now to drinks and food with us, but it's unfortunately it's not. But uh, we wish you the best and have a great evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. Take care. Thank you all for participating.